Welcome back to the Morning Show here on the Raj News. Now, without wasting time, we will now turn to our first guest, Honorable Patrick Obayabo, a lawyer and a member of Nigeria's ruling All Progressive Congress. Between the year 2007 and 2011, Mr. Obayabo represented the Oredo Federal Constituency in Edo State in the House of Representatives. He also served as Chief of Staff to the former Governor of Edo State, Adams Oshomole. We want to say good morning and welcome to the morning show today. It is my pleasure to be your guest today, Aaron and Abisola. Good morning, Nigerians. Now, relying on your political experience, how do the presidential candidates of the three major political parties come across to you in terms of acceptability and the chances in the forthcoming elections? Let me start my prolegomenon by saying that coming into this election, only two major political parties are coming into this election, and not three major political parties. And the two major political parties are the APC and the PDP. But that asseveration notwithstanding, I make bold to asseverate that even though this election is going to be contested among two major political parties, the election is throwing up three, three major presidential aspirants. And those three major presidential aspirants are His Excellency former Governor Peter Obi, His Excellency former Vice President of the country Atiku Abubakar, and of course, the Jagaban of Bogu himself, Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. How do these three presidential aspirants come to me? And what are their chances? I will start with former governor Peter Obi. The Spartan discipline, which Peter Obi has emblematized, his simplicity, his courage, and his quixotic zeal for bringing about the Pax Nigeriana of our dreams, commend itself to my patriotic palate. Another second statement I want to make about Peter will be is that I do sincerely hope, and this is a rhetorical question to the political class, I do sincerely hope that Nigeria's parasitic and prebender political class are learning the necessary lessons that has greeted the emergence of Governor Peter Obi. And I'm talking about the sheer emotionalism. I'm talking about the paroxysm of phrasism that has greeted the emergence of Governor Peter Obi. A favor that his supporters refer to as the obedient movement, but which I choose to describe as the emerging and surging political circle of obeistic obeism. And what are these lessons to be derived there from this obeistic obeism? It is that one, Nigerians, and particularly the Nigerian youth, have become completely dissatisfied. They've become languorous. They're in a state of lassitude as to the failings and frailties of the Nigerian political class, the entire Nigerian political class, be it APC, PDP, NNPP, or what have you. That is the statement that Nigerians and Nigerian youth are making. They made that first statement, which galvanized into the protestations that led to the NSAS debate. The NSAS. That was when the Nigerian youth made that first statement that they have become completely tired of the entire political class. So the Peter Obi tendency and proclivity 
in our Nigerian political tea juncture just now is another re-emergence, a renewed resurgement of that dissatisfaction. So if you ask me, I will say that Governor Peter Obi just now is only a vessel, is a receptacle of that tartness, that virulence, that acrimony, that causticity, that acerbity, that asperity, and that moroseness, with which Nigerians, and particularly the Nigerian youths, perceive of the entire Nigerian political class just now. But will Peter Obi, can Peter Obi ride on the crest and wave of this Nigerian, disap this, this Nigerian disappointment into the comfortable bowels and bosom of the Azo Rock Villa? I said, no. I, I, I don't see that. And I say so with all sense of responsibility. And that is why I drew the crucial difference between two political parties. Short of and mention myself in an aqua of political Nambi Pambism. I don't see how the Labour Party can muster 25% in about 24 states in this election. So Peter Obi and the Labour Party, are, they will come face to face with the political and electoral 12 Labours of Echoes. But however, I salute his courage. I recognize his, his sincerity to want to cleanse, cleanse the Nigerian audience tables. That would be my position just now on Peter Obi. All right. Uh... Atiku Abubakar, former vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. How does it come across to me? And one, what are my perception of his chances? Atiku Abubakar has not had the privilege to serve in any executive position. The only political piazza where he has served was when he came under the shadows of the looming, towering, and avuncular former president Matthew Aremu Okikyolaka Olushegun Obasanjo. Who else can give a comparendo, an objective account of Atiku Abubakar more than his boss that he worked with for eight years? The last time I checked, the comparendo, or if you like, call it the report card by former President Olusha Gwabasanjo on Atiku Abubakar was very unflattering was uncomplimentary and very damning in any material particular. Atiku Abubakar comes to me as a candidate who wants to bring about his ambition, not even caring about puncturing the fragile lines Puncturing the centripetal forces, the agglutinating forces that binds Nigeria together. Why do I say this? The PDP party constitution recognizes zoning. The 1999 constitution talks about federal character. And that was why all the southern governors and well many Nigerians begged, practically on their knees, begging all Northern political dramatist personnel to zone the presidency in their party to the, to, to the South. Because it, it, it will be maniacally bewildering. It will be testing the patience of Job that an Aousa Fulani Notana in President Mamadou Buari, having served for eight years, will not be replaced by another Aousa Fulani Notana in an article Abubakar. 
But that didn't matter much to him. I, I, I don't want to hear the fallacious argument that President Buhari was from APC. The question I ask was, was President Buhari, or is President Buhari president of APC? President Buhari is president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So it would be a fallacy of post hoc ego propter hoc and a fallacy of petitio principi begging the question to say that President Buhari was president of, of, of APC. What are his chances? I believe that the political gods of federal character, I believe that the political gods of justice, I believe that the political gods of equity, I believe that the political gods of all fair-minded Nigerians, who believe that the zoning principle that was constitutionalized in the PDP's constitution and that of the Federal Republic of Nigeria will not allow Atiku Abubakar to win the election. What more? We have about three PDP candidates in the three PDP candidates in the race in different political parties. Governor Peter Obi is going to dig deep electorally lacerate and macadamize the PDP in their traditional strongholds like the South-South and the Southeast. Little wonder that strategists like, like former Governor McAfee is already in a state of lacrimosism begging Peter Obi to come back to his original political homestead. That is because that, that gentleman recognizes that the Peter Big tendency is going to eat deep right. into the traditional stronghold of the PDP. We're going so, to have to come in there so that we can, you know, ha talk about, you know, a wide range of topics as well. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I love your adjectives, some very interesting adjectives you have used to describe this the different parties. But let's move on a little bit to some more recent happenings and a conversation we were having just minutes ago in the studio before you joined us. How justified is Governor Yesom Wike in his strivings within the people, uh, People's Democratic Party? Would you say he's burning his bridges? I will, I will answer that question, but, but uh, you will not be fair to me, Abisola, if, if, I don't talk about, if, if, if I don't talk about the other major presidential candidates, yes, Asiwaju, please. Bola, Ahmed, Tinubu. Yes, please. We if want to do that. that. We want to do that I will run, in good I will run time. Through, I, will yes, run, I will run through that. Like a, yes. Talking about Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu is like talking about the political Oriri Bobo himself. If you ask me, I believe that of all the presidential candidates in the race just now, that is the candidate that engaged in self-immolation and self-abnegation and paid the price for democracy. So he's the only one just now that can consolidate on the dividends of this democracy. And before I answer the next question, his examples in Lagos State is an exemplary gratia of good governance. A man who turned the internal, the internal revenue generation of Lagos State from a portion of 600 million to about 50 to 60 billion, introduced free education up to higher institution level, introduced free health scheme for children be below the ages of 18 and adults above the ages of 65, removed Lagos from a cesspool of a dystopian state into an organized state. There, there's a lot, there's a lot of positives to talk about uh, Asiwaju Bola Ahmed uh, uh, Tinubu and why he's the leading candidate for this election. But, but, but you say there's, there's no time for that. On, uh, on Governor Yisong Wike, I laugh when I hear some person stigmatizing him that in recent times he has become loquacious and garrulous. For you to be able to sustain that argument, you must place a background on what is the origin of this crisis. And the origin is sufficiently in the public domain. One, the PDP constitution recognized zoning. And gets the run of play. 
you put up a zoning committee, the autumn zoning committee. And before that committee was even inaugurated, you foisted a fate accompli on PDP by throwing the presidential nomination forms open, working from end to means. Now, you went for a presidential convention and guess the run of play and guess the breach and violation of the protocols of the convention. You yielded the convention grounds to the governor of Sokoto State, Aminu Tambuwa, to come and put to seppuku the ambition of Governor Yeson Wuke. As if that was not enough, the chairman of the party, in an act of indiscretion, was to congratulate the Sokoto State Governor for doing in Wiki Abba. Is the matter to human being? And you say you should cry for her? As if that was, as if that was, that was enough, the presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, now put in place a committee to recommend to him a possible vice presidential nominee. Majority of that committee pointed at the direction of Wiki. You displayed loath and anathema for the man. And without even having the courtesy of telling him, this is my direction. You went after school, open air, that is, and made your announcement. That was stanza one. Stanza two. Now we are, now we are hearing that the national chairman of PDP has stigmatized Wiki, who comes along with about three PDP sitting governors, about three former PDP governors, former ministers, as children. I discharge and acquit Wiki of the charge of loquacity and garrulity. I say that Wiki is not a mandibula walkabout. He's fighting for justice, he's fighting for equity, he's fighting for fairness, and he's fighting for political rectitude. All right, um, we hear you. But is Atiku Abubaka the best PDP could have put forward, given the peculiar circumstances of the party that needed to maintain its traditional stronghold in the South South and the Southeast? I, I actually, I, 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 I actually answered that question when I did say it on that the obey movement, the obedient movement, which I call the obesity obesity, that has thrown up former Governor Peter Obi, is going to dig deep into the traditional stronghold of PDP. The South South and the South East used to be where PDP has cut blanche, cut blanche votes. But that is no longer going to happen. So if you ask me, from that circumstance, PDP should have looked elsewhere. PDP should have looked elsewhere. That is my position. All right, let's, let's uh, move ahead. You spoke about Governor Peter Obi, um, well, quite in colorful terms, but at the same time, you also challenged his strength to sit up Nigeria's highest political office. But one thing that actually has to be very clear is that he has ignited an irreversible wave of political awareness amongst Nigerian youth. What is your assessment of that movement? I know you've spot touched on it, but let's look at it quite um, holistically. Could this um, portend that he has, has the strength and numbers to actually sit on this particular office that you uh, claim that he possibly won't be able to handle? And that, is why, and that is why I ask the question that I hope the Nigerian political class are learning the necessary lessons from the, from the plaudits that have greeted the Peter Obi tendency. I agree with your statement that his tendency is going to bring about an irreversible catalyst before the youth going forward. 
I agree with you. But is this favor enough to galvanize the momentum of Peter Obi to become a president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria just now? And I said, no. I don't see it. But what Peter Obi's tendency has taught me, and I do hope that, that and I do hope that the Nigerian political class learned that lesson, is that anybody who thinks that the Arab Spring is only restricted to the Arab communities and that it's not possible in happening in Nigeria, then such a person is living in political hocus pocus and luxuriating in the aqua of political jikari pokeri. The answers was a mini Arab Spring in Nigeria. So Peter Obi is making a very positive contribution. The reaction, I am happy about the reaction, greeting his candidacy. But I only hope that the entire political class of this country, they are learning that lesson. But like I said, you need a practiced and deep-rooted political party amongst other qualities to be able to win presidential election. The Labour Party does not have that deep rooted nature in all the states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That is going to be its limitations. And uh, it will not win. It will not win. Do you see, in, in light of what you understand of the Labour Party's, uh, you know, um, manifesto, which we will, we will get to understand much better, do you believe that in the future, because what you say and what I'm hearing you say right now is that he's not, the, the party has got no um, power to sit on, in that office currently, but do you see this happening in, in you know, future dispensations, perhaps? If Peter Obi doesn't win this election, and he doesn't jump ship to another political party, and he remains and provides himself to become a spiritual primus mobilus and political dowager for the Labour Party, and forms an, and forms an, alternate, an, an alternate government, not an alternate government from a perfidious and treasonable point of view, but an alternate government just like late Papa Jeremiah Bafemi Awolowo, the, the late Kenny philosopher, used to do in those days, then there is hope and possibility in Fort Euro in the, in the future for the Labour Party and Peter Obi. All right. Um, Honorable Barabo, permit me to actually quote from the headline of this day um, today, being Saturday. Um, okay. It says here, quoting... Uh, Reverend Father Matthew Hassan Kuka and what he said when he was on the Rise News yesterday. He says, people have understood they were lied to in the 2015 polls. Referring to the APC, what they promised, and ultimately in the last seven years, what they've delivered. Two contrasting situations we find ourselves here, or two contrasting scenarios. What do you make of this particular statement? Is it true? I didn't quite get that. He says, people have understood they were lied to in the 2015 polls, referring to the APC and what they have delivered in the last seven years and what they promised before coming into power in 2015. This is true. I am sure when people raise critical objurgations, and animadversions against what they perceive as the failures of the APC government. I'm sure particularly they are talking about the economy and talking about insecurity. I will not sit down here as a student of society to say that the, to say that the APC government has caught I on the area of security, or even on the area of economy. I won't sit down here to say so. But I will say to you that there are, extenuating, there are extenuating circumstances. And those extenuating circumstances has to do 
with the recession in the global economy. Those external circumstances has to do with the COVID-19 pandemic and its concomitant incubus that was foisted on this nation. But that is not to say that beyond economy and security, it is not to say that the APC government has not made giant strides in all other areas, like infrastructure, in all other areas in the economy. I, ha I have a 67-page 67, 67 document that has documented the achievements of the Buhari administration. If you invite me here another day to specifically talk about... Uh, uh, Honorable Obama, but will you permit me at this point to interject for the sole reason that the NPC came on the band on, on, the, on the back of the fact that they were going to fix three major things. You've scored them low on two of them. And the third one is almost evident. It's what has almost crippled the other two, understanding that several oil-producing nations are smiling to the bank during this whole period of the Ukraine-Russia crisis. Nigeria seems to be the only one weeping, no thanks to the fact that corruption sees us lose 90% of the oil we produce into the hands of bandits. So where we should be probably cushioning the effects of the economy and probably using this money to provide for better security, we're finding out that deep-rooted corruption has also destroyed what should have been probably a buffer for Nigeria and Nigerians. So you mentioned infrastructure, but when it comes to, when it comes to security, the economy, and the corruption campaign, Everyone seems to be scoring them, including yourself, has scored the APC very low. That is not to say that, that, I've, that I've said to you that uh, I'm not sure that we have got it right completely on the area of security. Does not itself show that giant strides were not made on security? If you know where we are coming from, during, during the PDP era, we saw a situation where security became an umdinger, an, um, an umdinger gorgon medusa over the entire length and breadth of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Even, even, right, even right in Abuja here, the last presidential election was postponed because of insecurity. So it is not to say that the government has completely failed in providing security. No. Solutions of security belongs to you and me. But I'm saying sincerely that security is work in progress. We didn't get it, we have not gotten it right completely. But it's not to say that there is a gaping lacuna in the efforts of government and governance. No. That is not what I'm saying. In the area of in the area of in the area of infrastructure, we have done so well. People have been prosecuted and jailed every day on the area of malversation and defecation of public funds. I'm not too sure you want to say that corruption thrives more, as Stephen more in the APC government than we saw in the PDP government. I say a to the rejectamenta to that asseveration and pontification of yours. No. In the PDP era, corruption was working on the streets of Abuja. Corruption was sleeping in the hotel rooms of Hilton here, where I'm speaking from. So in corruption, we have done well. It is work in progress. But over, over, and over, and above, over and above all that, the presidential candidate of APC, Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tirubu, is a man who has demonstrated that he can deliver. 
Yes, I am not, I'm not extricating APC or extricating our presidential candidate from the assets and liabilities of this government. But that is not to make the point that a see was not was not part and parcel of this government. Look at his track record. He has done it. And he can do it for Nigeria. He has the might and stash. He took care of security that was a Frankenstein monster in Lagos. He took care of everything bad in Lagos. If you must know, I'm not referring to the Nation newspaper, nor am I referring to TVC, but the Economist, the Economist, an international news medium, once described Lagos as the biggest economy in Africa even bigger than Ghana and Kenya. Those were the efforts of Asiwaju Ahmed Bonatinubu. Today, today, Lagos contributes the highest to the federation account in VAT, in education tax fund, and in petroleum tax fund, amongst others, because of the thriving and booming economy of Lagos State. Those were the efforts of Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. All right, Mr. Obanyabo, what this country needs now is a recognition of our diversity. I see why Bola Ahmed Tinubu assembled, assembled eggheads and men from various, from various, from various quarters in Nigeria right. to, to bring about the political tomatoes. Right. Well, some will argue will with that you that now we're talking on a national scale and it's a different uh, kind of responsibility when you're talking, you're, you're making comparisons between, um, you know, achievements within the state uh, level and we're looking at a federal, more national level. But I, I'm going to digress. We can't keep talking about scorecards and lacunas without discussing another pertinent issue on the front burner in this country. We all know your passion for education is, you know, quite well known. Let's talk about your take on the ongoing ASUS strike and its long-term implications on the country. What do you make of this? Well, before, before I, 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 I talk about that, let me say that uh, it will be a reductio absurdum and to make light of Asiwaju Bola Ahmed, Ahmed Tidubu's contribution and what it can do for Nigeria if you restrict its achievements just alone to Lagos State. Because Lagos State is mini Nigeria. Having said that, let me say that the problem with ASU is the collective, is the, is the collective neglect by successive federal governments over time to education. UNESCO, UNESCO's recommendation is that 26% should be devoted in each annual budget to tackle educational challenges in every country. And that is because it is capital intensive to run education, particularly at the tertiary level. What has been the devotion of successive federal governments? in the annual budget to education. Particularly zero. A 2009 agreement. This government, this government, this government came into, came into being before 2009. That is not pleading extenuating circumstances for its own neglect, however. But we are in 2022. A 2009 agreement that the federal government entered into with ASU has been honored in the British. And people are saying that, and people are saying that uh, ASU is irresponsible. No, 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 no. They are patriots. They are fighting for our country. They are fighting for Nigerians. I call on the, I call, I call on the federal government to honor its agreement to ASU. Government, 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 government is a continuum. That is my take on ASU and the current educational imbroglio, which has become calamitous. All right, I want to say many thanks to you, Honorable Patrick Obagbo, for your time here.
on the morning show. How wish we had time? Because we would have loved to hear from you concerning the back and forth concerning the projects and also the contracts awarded to some people in the Niger Delta. But it's now time for a short break. And when we come back, we shall be linking up with our next set of guests, Professor Biodu Adeni of Bayes University of Buja and Utibe Hencho of the Educational Partnership Center. Stay with us.